So Jesse, as you know, I grew up in a hockey household. Okay. Hockey night in Canada, Saturday nights, me and my dad, uh, he was a big Leaf fan. Uh, we grew up just outside of Toronto. So even at a very young age in the eighties, I heard so many Harold Ballard stories. Some were funny, some were not so funny, and some were just downright crazy. Um, I, as I got older, these stories continued to take on a life of their own because this man was this man before the age of social media, YouTube, internet, everything. Uh, and for so many years, especially when I got in this business, Jesse, I wanted someone to tell the Harold Ballard story. And they finally did. Um, the doc is called Offside, the Harold Ballard story. And a couple of those men who were responsible for this are joining us on the Athletic Hockey Show. We've got the director and narrator, someone I've been a huge fan of for many, many years, Jason Priestley, and the executive producer, Michael Geddes. Guys, thanks so much for coming on. Hey, you got it, guys. Hey, great to be here. Uh, Jason, let's start with you. And this might be a really stupid question, given the uh, intro I just gave, but uh, why Harold Ballard? <laughs> why, why did you want to tell this crazy man's story? And why did you think this was the time to do it? Well, I mean, you know, how could you not want to tell uh, the story of Harold Ballard? I mean, it's, uh, I, I, you know, we, you know, we when when we started to to, to examine uh, the story of Harold, we couldn't believe that no one had had told his story uh, in this con in in this fashion before. You know, a lot of people had had sort of done you know ten or fifteen minute um, you know, featurettes on him, uh, but no one had sort of really done a, a big you know feature length documentary deep dive on, on him and his character before. And as you know, it told his full life story before. So we, we wanted to, uh, uh, you know, take this opportunity to do that. I, I don't have the history that Rob does, uh, with this subject. It was all brand new to me going into it. But, uh, what, I, what I'd like to know, I guess from Michael is when you went into this, you obviously knew a lot about the guy. Did your perception change or was it, or basically was it just, this is exactly what we thought. Um, and then we just dug further into what we, what, the, the type of man we thought this guy was. Yeah. I mean, during the seventies, I was a teenager, believe it or not. And, um, yeah, I knew a lot about Ballard. You'd hear it. You'd hear it from your dad. You'd hear it from watching the telecasts. He was, uh, his reputation preceded him, obviously. So when we got into this, uh, I didn't expect we'd move the needle at all on that perception. However, it was, it was just interesting. Um, you know, here's a guy that, uh, was 68 years old when he, he got to the top of his uh, mountain and, and got control of the Leafs. And I mean, talk about a guy who had to, uh, take on a whole new breath of life and go forward. Well, that was Harold. I mean, he, did, he went full steam for another 20 years, which is kind of unbelievable. So I, I didn't know that. And, that might give a lot of perspective to the guy who was Harold Ballard and how he ran the team. Because, I mean, somebody born in 1903, you're, you're not changing that guy. Uh, there's no changing him. And he was old school as old school gets. And the way he helmed the team, I think, uh, wasn't uh, a surprise because, again, his reputation preceded him. But there were just some tidbits along the way in this documentary that being, you know, 68 years old when he assumed control of the team. And maybe an another great tidbit was, you know, he, he, he was in debt. He assumed a lot of debt to get this team. And people forget that. I mean, you've got, you've got that weight on your shoulders called, you know, the bank and a big mortgage uh, on that team. Um, you know, financially, I don't think he had any pressure on him, but, uh, by all, you know, by all accounts, he owed the bank a lot of money. So that, that was something I did not know. Guys, this question may be for both of you. Um, sometimes tracking down guests and people who are willing to talk about such a polarizing figure can be difficult. I loved all the guests. Everyone who was involved with Harold Ballard seems to have been in this documentary. And I'm wondering, because none of them really held back. I, I felt like everyone was so honest. Uh, no one sugarcoated it. A lot of times when someone's you know no longer with us, they don't want to trample on someone's grave. That wasn't necessarily the case. Did you almost find it was <laughs> too easy to get guests for this thing? Were people very willing to say, I am, I would love to talk about Harold Ballard. Jason, we'll start with you. Well, uh, we did, we, we, we were able to find um, a lot of people, like you say, that, that were willing to talk about Harold. I mean, it's sort of, 
I think I think people were a little more trepidatious at the beginning, but once we got our first few people, it was there was sort of a domino effect. Um, and Gord Stelic, uh, who was one of the people who talked to us uh, for the documentary, uh, was very instrumental in helping us uh, access all of the a, a lot of the players who who came and uh, talked to us. Certainly, the journalists uh, were all very um, uh, very eager to, and and willing to to talk to us about their interactions with Harold over the year, and and people were very forthcoming um, about their remembrances of of working with Harold, and that was. That was actually one of the driving factors for us in, in making this documentary. Now, you know, people, those people who actually did have a lot of personal interactions with him are starting now to, to get to an age where they're they're starting to shake off this mortal coil and and uh, and leave the planet. You know, um, so it, it's important to uh, to document uh, their remembrances of him before they actually um, uh, exit stage left. And I think. You know, once we once we started getting people in the tent per se, and it was a tent because it was a bit of a circus, uh, obviously for twenty years. Um, I think you know, getting getting Settler, getting Wendell, two different eras of Ballard. You know, uh, Wendell came in as the the hot rookie at eighteen years old and started immediately, and was a key member of that team at eighteen years old. Settler coming to the team when he was a rookie back in the early seventies. Once those two guys came in to kind of bookend this documentary, I think the rest of them, you know, had that had that assurance to come in, and, and then you know we got vibe and we got a number of key players. And I think because we weren't looking to move the needle on Harold the Bad, because that story has been well told, and as I said, his reputation precedes him. We really wanted their introspective on what it was like being around with Ballard as their boss, and. Uh, yeah, they they, they all they all seem to have a level of respect for him too, which was which was curious. Depending on even people that had bad experiences, you know, like Rick Vive, at one end of the spectrum, and the documentary you saw the guy Rick scores fifty goals three years in a row, and uh, life was kind of miserable at that time for him as a Maple Leaf. I mean, <laughs> put that to today, any player in the NHL that scores fifty goals three years in a row, that's not going to happen. Yeah. So that just tells you, you know, from the top down how how uh, fracture, uh, you know, fractured things were for that team. So it, it was great to get their perspective. Yeah. And, and that being said, just quick follow up on guests. One that jumped out to me. I'm not going to lie. I saw Alan Eagleson on the screen. I went, whoa, Alan Eagleson doesn't do too many interviews anymore. And uh, he's got a checkered checkered past of his own. So I'm wondering, um, just when you guys were, were putting together a list of people you wanted to talk about, was there any debate as to whether Alan Eagleson should, shouldn't be on this given his past? And and did he need some convincing to come on? Jason? We did uh, talk about it. Um, but at the end of the day, um, Alan's very, very, personal uh, interactions with Ballard um, sort of won the day, you know, his, his whole thing, you know, he, he, him and Ballard were very heavy collaborators on the, on the whole summit series. Um, and they, they were part they were business partners through that whole process. And we sort of felt like his deep business connections with Ballard sort of, sort of tipped the scale and, in his favor and in, in being included in the documentary, but it was uh, a difficult decision for us given his um, difficult uh, uh, past with uh, and with the NHL and the NHLPA at all. As, as kind of an outsider on this subject, I, one of the things I kind of wanted to know was like, okay, this is a team that is one of the oldest, most storied. They had so much success before he took over. Like, how did it, like, what happened here? Like, what was the, and to me, one of the things that stood out was just the leanness that he ran it with. Like, they talked about the scouts not having, and like the one throwaway line that I, that stood out so much to me was he didn't want the names on the back of the players' jerseys because he thought he wouldn't sell enough programs, which is insane to me. Like, <laughs> Is that like when you boil it down, do you think that was the number one reason that they, the downfall? Like, obviously, there are so many things that happened under him. But like, to me, it seemed like the unwillingness to spend, despite being one of the most profitable teams, that was what it kind of all boiled down to. Yeah, I mean, it, it goes to, to Harold's personality. He came from money. Um, he didn't come from poverty as a child and growing up in the, in the city. He had a privileged upbringing, yet 
he was uh, tighter than two coats of paint. <laughs> you know, so that's how we ran the team just in a general sense. But, you know, you look at what was going on, first, first of all, when the Leafs were, were great and not taking away anything from that throughout the 60s, there were six teams in the league. Um, most of the cups were dominated by Montreal and Toronto. Fast forward to when Ballard uh, eventually uh, had control of the team in 71, 72, the WHA had arrived. Uh, how do you deal with a new league? That was foreign territory for everybody. He obviously didn't manage it well because he, he didn't take it seriously and he let a lot of players go and they went for more money. Of course, he wasn't going to pay them what they deserve and recognize that there's, there's now s- some new dynamics to deal with. And then I think just overall, here's a guy again who was stuck in the past. The league had changed. The, the players union, the perspective of how teams were run, television contracts were changing the game. And access to the teams were from a, from a viewer standpoint, we're getting, you know, broader. Remember back in the sixties, the CBC didn't even air the game until the start of the second period. Um, which was crazy. That's the way they, because there were other programs in this country more important. So somebody along the way determined that hockey in Canada needed to be broadcast and be an anchor to their schedule. And thankfully they did, but a lot of moving parts for Ballard. And, and part of me thinks, you know, he didn't just know how to manage that. He was stuck in the past and he, there's some great quotes that deal with this in our documentary. Um, but he was an old school, old principled guy used to dealing with a boys club that all of that was coming apart on him the moment he took control of that team. And along those lines, um, the section which deals with, you know, I talked off the top of the show about my dad telling me things. He used to say, this man's a racist. This man's a a homophobic. This man's a um, a sexist. That was a difficult part of the doc for me to watch. And I don't mean that as as far as the film goes. I just mean the subject matter. Uh, Was that difficult when you were putting that part together? Because in 2023, hearing him tell Barbara Frum on her own show, to shut up and women should only be on her back or hearing him use the N word on multiple occasions. That, that just stung for me, Jason. Yeah, it was, it, 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 it is, it, you know, that, that kind of stuff is difficult, but I, but I think that, you know, showing, showing that stuff I think is important, you know, um, because it, because I think it's very revealing as to who he really was, you know, and I, and I, and I think, and I think that, you know, but but also remember, we're you know we're viewing all that stuff through a through a twenty twenty three lens, right? And it was and it was and it was you know they were different times back then, right? And, and not not to excuse it because you can't excuse it, but it but I think that uh, I think that things were viewed a little differently back then. He, I mean, his 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 behavior was still outrageous for even back then, right? Which which makes it <laughs> extra outrageous today. And, and I think, yeah, the way, just the way putting, putting all that in perspective as Jason just did, you know, you have to remember he, he was an original character in himself. I mean, Canada didn't have anybody like him at that time. I don't think there was anybody you could say was as big and grandiose and as awkward as Harold was. Uh, and yet added to that, he owned the most important and high profile public co- uh, company in this country at the time, the Toronto Maple Leafs. Um, Maybe Leaf Gardens Limited. So you put those two things together. I mean, getting headlines was clearly for Harold what excited him. And uh, we've said on many occasions he he had a the, this documentary and Harold had a had a Trumpian flair to what he did. And what we mean by that is, I mean, he kind of was Canada's Trump before Trump, but also he knew the media and how to play the media probably better than anybody did. Uh, in a very innocent, different Toronto and Canada at the time. He was a bit of a trailblazer. He wasn't trailblazer in many things, but he certainly was in how, how he played the me- media, for sure. I've been lucky enough to do some, some, some documentary-style stuff for CBC as well, and i got to ask you about just diving into those archives. I mean, I was so happy to see the apartment. I'd heard so much about the apartment in Maple Leaf Gardens and the fact that you guys had <laughs> footage of that. I thought, this is fantastic. But I also know that sometimes things have to hit the cutting room floor. Uh, they're like, you know, killing your children at times. They say that. Was yeah. there anything that yeah. ended up time-wise, 
or just you just couldn't fit it into the storyline that maybe you wish you could have? Interestingly, and Jason can can add to this, but um, as public as Harold was, there weren't many one-on-one interviews with Harold uh, back in the day. Most of his exchanges were, you know, impulsively done when the media showed up, uh, a media scrum, um, or when they were following him. And I mean, not in a paparazzi way, but he did very few interviews. Um, He loved headlines and he loved print. And he had a very love-hate relationship, of course, with the print media. Um, but, you know, we, we, we were challenged, it's a long way of saying, basically, we were challenged. We, we, we had to look long and hard for some of this footage. And, um, sure, Hockey Night in Canada, he was, he was on that show a few times as a guest. Um, you know, um, we didn't get a chance to put that on the air. That would have been fun because he was a little outrageous on those, those moments between periods. But, uh, yeah, I mean, in 90 minutes, we, we could have done two documentaries and, you know, maybe we should have. That's a two-parter. Uh, but you never know until you get into it. But, you know, Jason can kind of add to this as well. Yeah, there were, there were, there were a few other, uh, tidbits that were, you know, kind of gold, uh, Christmas party, you know, hockey night in Canada, Christmas party moments and stuff like that that, that were kind of gold, but we just couldn't find a place to, to squeeze that stuff in. But it was, um, but uh, you know, most most of the really good stuff that we were able to find in the archives, we we found places for in the film. But it was, but you know, like Michael said, it was you know for a guy who was so public, he re- he really didn't like to do one on one interviews that much. You know that the the Adrian Clarkson interview um, that that we utilized quite a bit of in the in the documentary was was really the the, the sort of the deepest dive one on one interview that 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 he really did. Um, and and uh, uh, and which was which was fascinating for such a for a guy who was such a public figure. The one thing that kind of got, jumped out to me as well, you know, the, this is a story. If you ask Lee fans from the '80s, you know, the greedy owner who decimated this team, drove it into the ground. Um, but I really love that you dove into some of his relationships with King Clancy, with you know Yolanda, with his own children. I mean, Ooh. I felt like, I don't know if you guys watched Succession. I kind of felt like I was watching an episode of Succession where, yeah. you know, this, yeah, this yeah, father yeah. and his kids <laughs> are completely battling over this right till the, you know, the moment of death. Um, were you surprised to see, because because of just his image, were you surprised to see that, you know, there were people who actually liked being around him all the time, Jason? Well, I, I, you know, I, I, I love that, you know, I love that there, there were guys who, uh, who really liked him and respected him, you know, um, Tiger Williams, uh, you know, and guys like that really, uh, really liked him and King Clancy loved him. Right. So there, and, and, and I think it was important to show that there, that there were guys who, uh, uh, who, who had those types of feelings towards him you know i i you know just you know having showing a documentary that's completely one-sided i felt would 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 be irresponsible of us you know because because he was uh you know he was a human being and he was a multifaceted human being and i and and you know of course you know there there are going to be lots of um detractors but uh, you know every and 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 harold harold i think was a was a was was a very interesting um, very mercurial, very, very divisive um, guy. And people either fell on one side of the fence or the other uh, in their interactions with him. And I, we felt like as filmmakers, it was our responsibility to just lay out all the evidence that we found in, in the making of this documentary and let the audience come to their own conclusions um, about Harold. So we, so we, laid, we lay it all out, the good, the bad, the ugly. And um, and let the audience come to their own conclusions about him at the end of the day. I can say, and Jason can can kind of uh, uh, double this. Since we've announced and gotten involved in this documentary, and it's it's well known that this documentary was coming, the amount of stories that have come our way that are anecdotal about Harold, there seems to be no end to them. Um, because you say his name, and it conjures up an immediate gutter, guttural response, and. You know, there's, there, there's these random act of, acts of kindness that, you know, people have, have offered up that, you know, didn't make it into the documentary that you just, there's no way to cover them. But, you know, he would buy drinks for people randomly in a bar if he, you know, 
saw a couple sitting that looked like maybe they were young and he he took to them he would just go over and say look i, I want to buy all your drinks tonight he would he would do things like that and but he also did did funny things you know um he traveled with the team a lot um, more than any owner ever would by the way on the plane and again this didn't make it in the documentary but he routinely towards his later years before they went on the tarmac and crossed the tarmac to get on the plane he would go and pee on the front wheel of the plane and i don't know what that was about but he, he did it on every flight <laughs> and i mean um now as a passenger on that plane i'm not sure if that would be a good thing but um they they got off the ground every time but uh, you, you know you hear these things and, and and i think it's you know there's no end to that um did that get covered in the documentary no but <laughs> Um, there's, there's How a did you not stories. put that story in? When I wish I asked it had. Yeah, I wish it had. Come on, that had to be in there. Well, no, the, the, well, it wasn't on the cutting. There was, it wasn't footage. There was no footage of Harold being on a plane. <laughs> so, unfortunately, yeah, we could we couldn't figure out if that was just folklore or if that actually really mm -hmm. happened. If someone would have taken a picture of it. We would have known for sure. But actually, it is I'll, pretty I'll good. tell you my favorite while we're on this topic. <laughs> um, Harold, and this came our way. Harold could get on the phone and call any uh, sports editor at any paper and was guaranteed a headline the next day. Um, there was a, a, a women's club in Toronto that was a, a women's country club for, you know, business women, powerful feminists in the city called the McGill Club. Um, it was their own thing. Uh, unfortunately, they, they got into some financial pressure. They had to sell their building and vacate. Uh, Harold got wind of that. Um, and being kind of the misogynist he was, he, he looked at it as an opportunity. And he announced to the media that he was buying the McGill Club. And in the moment it was vacated, he was turning it into a Playboy Club. And it, there was no truth to it. He never made an approach to the McGill Club. He got ink in the paper the next day. And it was only just to piss off a whole uh, demographic of successful wow. women in the city. So, I mean, you can't make that stuff up. No. Uh, of course, it never materialized, but that's the kind of, and Harold laughed harder than anybody about that, I'm sure. So that was <laughs> the Harold that, and the stories continue, by the way. So that's what I mean when I say his stories took on a life of their own. I mean, yeah. it just, they, yeah. you know, some, like Jason said, some were folklore, some were true. We're going to leave you with one more, guys. Um, We've all heard of the curse of Harold Ballard, the Harold Ballard curse, whatever you want to call it. Leafs still haven't won a cup since 67. Uh, if the Toronto Maple Leafs win the cup this year, are you going to try to take credit for breaking that curse finally with this documentary? 100%. Absolutely. Yes. <laughs> and I would and I would hope that, Toron that, Tor that Toronto Maple Leafs would invite me to some sort of a ceremony um, uh, to celebrate <laughs> us and our film. Uh, as uh, as an integral part of uh, finally breaking the curse, get you in the parade. You'll be in the parade exactly. if they win 100%. the Stanley Cup. In the parade, and I would take it a step further. I'd want a pair of platinums. <laughs> oh wow, wow! Yeah. Smoking like someone like, who I like uh, the way you yeah. take, Michael. Just yeah. thinking long term. That's, the doc yeah. is offside. The Harold Ballard story. It's fantastic, uh, guys. Thanks so much for doing this. We really appreciate it. Look forward to more of your stuff. Thanks, guys. Nice to talk Thank to you. Thank you.